Bradley Cook, how the devil are you? Doing fabulous. Marvellous. So we're here, back here, because we've already filmed a video here at Barefoot. Oh, is there this, we go. Is this kind of a, a uh, home away from home for you? Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, Marvelous. I've been around here for 18 years, off and on. That's amazing. 18 years? Yeah, Eric bought the bill. I, I met Eric in 95, and I rented his studio to uh, produce uh, this band called The Dwarves. I remember The Dwarves well. He was, it's, Eric was so good, he's our assistant. It's like, man, we should just hire this guy to engineer the records, and we can just produce. <laughs> you know, right. but I uh, saw so he built this building in 2000 and uh, I've been assisting him for, you know, different projects for, throughout the years and, you know, leaving to do engineering stuff on my own. Fantastic. All over the place. Well, your yeah. resume is pretty, uh, pretty darn impressive. Oh, I haven't looked at my re uh, resume for a long time. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what's on there. <laughs> I don't you think that when you're actually like working, especially because we were talking off camera about the role of an engineer is this, like everything goes through you. Everything. Flow master. It's, it's like when I'm producing, it's great. I can sort of goof off a little bit. I can sit on the couch in the back there, check a couple of emails while you're doing an overdub, you know, like, oh, I can trust, you know, Bradley's going to do the guitar overdub and that's fine. And I'll just quickly check this and talk to the label and all this kind yeah. of stuff. When you're the engineer. It's a lot to keep track of. A lot to keep track yeah. of. What do you, th do you think, um, because I remember, I'm sure you do as well, that sort of period, I suppose it was in the late 90s, definitely early 2000s, where, you know, there was still sort of a Pro Tools guy. Yeah. Maybe there was a guy running Pro Tools and you were allowed to sit there and get tones. I mean, now you're like the everything. It's like you're the assistant, probably, the engineer, yeah. producer, co-producer, mixer, Pro Tools engineer, guitar tuner. Be nice to have Pro Tools guys again. Yeah. It's handy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> out of the busy work. But yeah, we're, we're just doing everything, you know, basically soup to nuts. I, I personally like the challenge though. I think it sort of keeps my brain going, but yeah, but it is nice when I can stand back and trust a guy like you to. Yeah. I like to work with a band, like from the beginning, like go to rehearsals and stuff and know, you know, figure out the songs and what we're, what we're up to before we come in the studio and take it all the way through like that. That's amazing. Rather than a surprise. So who are you working with at the moment? Um, we, uh, Holy Child last week here. We did a bunch of cool overdubs like woodwinds, brass, strings, harp, a um, bunch of synthesizers, timpani, Fantastic. orchestra bells. A lot of fun stuff. Yeah. What else? Boys choir. Oh, that's right. We had a boys choir. and A, a boys uh, choir? Uh, yeah, they're really funny. The, the little, little kid is about seven years old. He had... They must have went to Subway before he had mustard all over his shirt. It's hilarious. <laughs> he was so tired later. He cried later on. He was so tired. Aww. It was like <laughs> nine o'clock at night. And he was crying. We had a, a gospel choir come in too. They're really good. The, the people who sing on the voice, I guess. Oh, wow. They're super, super tight. Amazing. Yep. All the notes. <laughs> that, know, that's stacking. that's insane. I mean, we checked out the live room the other day and uh, it's, it, it's great. I love the way it's sort of separated off. So... But not really separated, but separated. Oh, the, the gobo wall. Gobo yeah. wall. Eric, Eric had an idea a couple summers ago to put a put a wall up because the, the room was just so he expansive. It was like, I don't know, just it was just too big, just too big. And we you know we built the wall, ready to tear it down if Casey didn't like it. But it it had just happened where the it improved the the live side. It was mm -hmm. super live, and the other side with the curtains is dead. So it really gave us cool variety and so some sort of ISO. You know, not 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 exactly a, a wall to, to isolate sound, just to separate separate stuff. So let's get a little bit into. I mean, how did you get into this uh, crazy business of ours? Um, when I was five, I, had, I cut out a cereal box of a Jackson Five ABC, and you know, watch the, the little record go <laughs> like that it's like uh i i want to do that whatever that is that's what i want to do i didn't even know what it was so you know went to a little bit of college for it and then um got a job in orange county at a like a heavy metal studio then i uh you know went to fullerton college and i didn't finish my degree because it was two more two more theory classes would have taken a whole year so i just i didn't have the patience so i just moved to hollywood and i got a job at grandmaster recording wow and i met sylvia massey there worked on the tool record and uh, she introduced me to um, uh, Kevin Mills at uh, Larrabee. So I worked at Larrabee as an assistant. And um, I also worked at the same time I worked at Virgin, Virgin Convent Studio over there. Do you Amazing. remember that place? I don't remember that. Greg, I mean, obviously, I remember Grandma's story. Greg Edward well. built that place. And it's, it's, it was just like, uh, Greg what, what's the Captain Tennille studio? 
A uh, rumbo. It, just like rumbo. So it's like right. a, a rumbo type design. Yeah. So that was, you know, I got to work on a bunch of cool stuff there. Amazing. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about Grandmaster because yeah. it just went, what, a year ago? Yeah. Unfortunately. It was a crazy, crazy studio. That place is amazing, like a ship. Have you been, had you been in there? Oh yeah, yeah, bunch of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 like a, a home, home away from home for sure. Like a, when I left to go start engineering, yeah, I always go back and it's like total family. You know, Alan, Alan Dixon and Jeff Tanner. That that Burke. crazy need, but you, it's hard to explain. I wish we'd done a, an episode there because you, you you there was like a door and then you kind of went. Rrr. I don't know how to explain how difficult it was to get in, and you could literally four people in there and you couldn't move. Well, you just had to kind of get past the console, <laughs> you know. It was, but an amazing live room. Yeah, great drum room. And there's something about the studio that when you were a kid and you imagine what recording studio should look like, that was the studio. Because it was like red velvet and just really super lush. And then upstairs you had the bar area. It looked like a brothel, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But it sort of like felt like what rock and roll yeah, guys would do, and totally. the Stones would be in there. It had that sort of feeling of a classic studio, for sure. And it yeah. had a Neve console, a very beautiful one. Yeah, a bunch of cool records were done there too. What did you work on there? I worked on uh, Ben Harper, "Fight for Your Mind," there, and then it, the ceiling was leaking, so we Ben he, he sings very quietly, so he's got his guitar and he's like, "Drip, <laughs> <laughs> drip report." <laughs> we're trying to get stuff, so we ended up uh, we left and went to Virgin. Virgin to finish everything because they were on a Virgin artist. That's and uh, I did the second Foo Fighters record there. We actually, me, me and Gil recorded up in um, Woodenville, Washington. And uh, our Pro Tools guy, Mark Fithian, was busy with Coldplay, I think, and he didn't didn't want to work on, didn't he didn't want to come over anymore. So we we're begging him to come. He wouldn't do it. So me and Gil were trying to, you know, edit the, edit the drums and stuff, and it was just a, a nightmare. We got back and realized that the drum the drums weren't weren't on as they should be so dave ended up redoing most of the drums on the record so we i, so I had read let's, that let's so go that... to let's go to grandmaster and you know we so we were recording at the same time we were mixing it so we you know hot off the hot off the machine down the street to uh, skip sailors for mix fantastic and like you know like uh, they're mixing and discovered it's like well monkey wrench needs another chorus guitar because it doesn't sound you know super big so right back down for an overdub for us and you know back to the mix studio it's kind of cool to do it you know so you can kind of add to it if you need to i love that that's in the moment you know in the moment yeah. and and again how when you're a kid do you want rec how you imagine records were made you know i remember sort of like watching those movies and I and they no would idea. finish it and then they drive over to the radio station and they play it that <laughs> night you know what i mean you want that sort of feeling of like just make decisions and do it yeah, yeah but we we of course already did the record once so it was like right knocking it out the second time was even better because we, we knew what we were up to you know did you keep the basic thing. overdubs and just redid the drums? We redid everything. Of oh, course. we redid everything. Of course, yeah. I can't. Yeah, it'd be impossible to play oh, drums wow. to what was. Yeah, so it has to start from the ground up again. But yeah. what was the process like the second time? Is it significantly faster because you'd learned? Well, you know, Dave. Dave has all the pushes in his head, mm -hmm. so he he knows where all the push pushes are and stuff. Yep. So he's he's going to play it right. So he 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 hadn't played drums for quite a, a few years and stuff. So he sat down. He was a little rusty for about. 10 minutes and then he was just killing it mm -hmm. it was amazing super amazing and, you know he, he knows where all the all the guitar pushes in or everyone i've heard people say that dave's playing the entire record but it's not true it's the it's the band playing it oh, okay that's mm -hmm. good it's good to yeah. know set some records straight um i suppose i have a couple of questions the thing about dave that i always loved as a drummer was i felt like he was a combination of bonham meets stuart copeland whoa do you know what I mean? <laughs> no. It sort of felt like to me, like he had that ability to push, like Copeland did, like ah, ah, really fast, but then lay back like Bonham. It's sort of like that. That to me was like the two extremes of drummers that could be blended together. He's got a super heaviness about him when he plays, yeah. for sure. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic. So, Grandmaster, what else? What, I, I want to know more about Grandmaster because I, I feel like now that it's gone. We don't really have an ability to sort of talk about it. And nobody's really talking about it because when you think about it, Tragic Kingdom was done there as well, which was like the it. sort of throwaway, you know, maybe I'm exaggerating, but you know, at that point, no doubt they were like, nobody was really caring about them and they made it a grandmaster. And, and of course that album went on to become such a massive album. I feel like it's like a little gem of a studio tucked away on Koanga that, you know, that you could, I, I think I could get in there for like, seven to nine hundred dollars depending on how busy they were 
when it, and this is back in the early 2000s. When, 950 was the, was the rate. Nine, was the book rate. And if you yeah. had 700 bucks and they yeah. didn't have anybody in there, you went in there. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's at a time when every studio in LA started at about 1500. That's right, yeah. Now, Grandmaster was a special place. Alan Dixon built it with his own hands. You know, he's like a, a, a yacht builder, a ship builder, mm -hmm. obviously. So the whole place looks like a ship. It's really trippy. You know, all, all the custom woodwork and stuff in there. Yeah. yeah, it's such a shame that we never got down there to do a video because... Just missed it. I know, isn't that crazy? Yeah, that, the board's got a good home now, though. It's, it's at, Where did it go? It's at uh, Vox Recording. Where's that? Um, Woody Jackson's place over on Melrose. Oh, wow. That's a place you should go. You should go visit them. Let's yeah. go visit them. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and also I used to hang out at, it used to be called Electrovox. It was like, the, it's the oldest studio in Hollywood. So Alan Gottschalk's father uh, started that place. So I used to, um, I met him, he, he would advertise microphones and tape machines for sale in the uh, recycler. So I went over there to buy some mics and he was just kind of sniffing around to see what he could get for mics. He didn't really want to sell them at that point. So we made friends and he showed me things like, you know, disc, disc cutting and disc bouncing stuff. Like you, mm -hmm. you got, would always have to redo the bass at the end because you'd lose the bass from successive bounces and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's why like, so the Beatles did the bass last and stuff. Like you, do, you always do it last because you lose it. They'd start out with the bass, but they just lose it for, in the bounce process. Oh, Trippy, I see. Right? So I'd, I'd hang out with him a lot and other people would come in trying to buy his microphones and him just gauging prices and stuff like that. So I ended up buying like, uh, when he, before he left, I bought an EV six six six, very acoustic. The, Al, the Al Schmidt was just talking about the six six six. The venerable EV six six six. I brought I brought it too. Please do. This is it. fantastic, and, and and I want to get back to microphones. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is a great segue. So Al said to us that when he was doing breezing, that they um, George just wanted a mic thrown up um, while they were tracking live, and the producer turns to Al and says, oh, that take was great. And I was like, we only did one take. He's like, yeah, it was perfect. And he goes, and I want to put a proper vocal mic up. And he goes, man, it sounds great. So, I mean, you've, if those have already seen Al, Al's video, will know that this was the vocal mic on George Benson breezing. Isn't that insane? And I've never used one of these. So thank you for bringing this. These are great. Like Alan said he used it for uh, piano and upright bass. Wow. I, upright bass? Yeah. It, it didn't win for me an upright bass next to a FET. But uh, right. this is cool. Like um, Eric used this on the first Slash record as a as a room mic in this ISO booth over here, just pointed at the corner, and it you know he he gets this like one microphone drum sound. He carves it out, and it just sounds amazing. It's like is yeah. that the six six six? And so he you know loved it so much he bought one. But these are these are great for stuff. Dark dark mic for amplifiers for guitar amps. So my guess is at the moment, I mean, how much are these things going for? I don't know. I probably got that for 300 bucks back in the day. But my guess is between your video and Al's, these are tripling in price. <laughs> um, can you, uh, Eric, can you look online? <laughs> I mean, look, let's be honest. I mean, it's uh, like a submarine. You, it, you see these on the like Beatles press conferences as well. Oh, right. And there's the 665 is a, a Chrome version, I think. Is it essentially the same mic, but yeah, Chrome? Yeah, yeah. Okay, th those just doubled. <laughs> They're easier to find than these two, I would say. That's amazing. The other thing is these static microphones. Like this is the microphone for the first vocal you hear in the Foo Fighters record, Dahl. He's because he heard that and he was like, "Whoa, this sounds like a like a PA mic. It's a carbon carbon button mic, right?" Who's it, mate? So it sounds like this. Um, a static. A static. Mm -hmm. We call it astastic because <laughs> it <laughs> it's, it sounds you know it sounds like the nineteen instant nineteen thirties vibe, you know. That's amazing. And also it's uh, on the Ben Harper record, it's uh, the vocal mic for Excuse Me, Mister, which the record company said, can you cut back on the vocal effect? Feels like a grenade. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was the answer. But it's great. Like last week I used to use it for underneath the piano. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. It kind of captures the, the wood part of a piano. Yeah. And it was interesting too, like I, I hadn't used it on vibes before. So we, we did the vibes and it actually sounded sort of hi-fi on vibes. And like you just tuck it up underneath everything. It's you know, really? folds it out on an acoustic guitar. You put it on the uh, bridge right here. Yeah. And you know, it's like that, that kind of wood, I don't know how to describe it, just the wood part, just the middle part that, you know, everyone's got these shiny guitars that sound like percussion when you, you know, amongst the mix. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, you can kind of just place that guitar anywhere in the stereo field easily. I've, I've found that as well. I like to mic the acoustic, the body, just, you know, and nowhere near the sound hole, like kind of directed away. I find, 
If I want pop, I'll put it on the strings. I'll pull it back or whatever. But I agree. I think miking the body of the guitar sounds more natural than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All oh, right. And there's no phase problems if you get well away. You know, it's right. a nice, nice little blend thing. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for doing this, bringing these mics. Oh, sure. You have any other gems sitting down there? Um, I didn't bring the very acoustic and stuff. Like I did bring these though. These are these are M five eight twos. Oh, right. So these are you know East German M five eight twos fifties. I bought these from Counting Crows. These these would be the uh, overheads on the Counting Crows record and and every record after that. This is my go to for overheads. There was a time when um, the Gefell versions of these were really inexpensive until people figured out that the, uh, the the East German ones were were just as amazing. I mean, the, you know that the wall came down and. Um, did Bill Bradley or someone go? Someone went over there and got a bunch of stuff. I think it was Bill Bradley, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, just bought a bunch of stuff from churches and stuff like that. So they're, they're, I think that was, I did the Kind of Crows record in 95. So it's gorgeous. Just to get, to get them really cheap. Now, so when when I came here last week and we were filming, I, I we talked about it because I, I feel like Recovering Satellites is one of the, the, the best sounding albums of, of the 90s. My, wow. He, and that, Particularly, I'd love to know any, give me any insight on that because I'm not sleeping. I still think it's the perfect combination between like Beatle sort of style writing with Americana kind of rootsy sound. To me, that was what defined the best thing about the Counting Crows is they could bring the American side and just marry it really beautifully with the, the sort of classic British stuff as well. One thing about that song, like, <laughs> so the Counting Crows, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to rent mansions to record the record and they just, you know, have a, a mobile setup. So, and I got to uh, have my dream studio, like they were just putting together their mobile thing. So I, you know, right. Studer 827 commissioned by Charlie Bolas and like just anything I wanted, just you name it, they got it from the list. And as we we're making the record, they said, you know, is there anything else you would need? Uh, you know, anything you're missing? It's like, how about a rack of API? 560s and stuff like that. So, bam, they just bought it. It was so dreamy. Oh, it was really wonderful. neat. And, you know, U69 microphones and Beautiful. C24s and things like that, you know. What were you using C24s on? Room mics. There's, there was a, there was a uh, a ballroom downstairs that was acted as a chamber. So where was the house? It was it was up Franklin. You know where the Mayfair Market is on Franklin? Yes. There's there's a street that goes all the way to the top of the hill and there's an art, a, a place called Artemisia. It was a congressman's mansion and there's an organ in the walls. So mm -hmm. it's like a full on, didn't work, but you, know, you open these little cubby doors and it's like, man, the organ just works, this organ works all over the house. Right. It's really cool. But like, I lived in Glendale at the time, but I, I just stayed there because there was so much to, to do in the morning uh, for setup and stuff. So I just slept there. And um, Adam had insomnia and stuff. I don't know if it's always true about him, but he just sleeps up, he just stays up all night and stuff and just couldn't sleep. So I told him, you know, if, if you're like inspired, come on over and wake me up. We'll do, you know, do a vocal or whatever. And I'm not sleeping is the one that he did that on. Came and woke me up. Wow. So it's literal. I'm not sleeping. So he's down there. Everyone else is sleeping. He's downstairs. I'm not sleeping anymore. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So that, that's like a late night, late night vocal. He just, you know, inspired by not sleeping. If you guys and girls haven't heard that song, there's, there's going to be some kind of Spotify link. To me, it's... I remember that that bridge. That one, two, three, four. That, you know that that part is so beatly. The strings on it. Are I'm gonna have to go back and listen. It's been a long time since and I that heard it. That guitar part. That cow, cow, cow. Dan Vickery. Oh. Yeah, those are probably uh, uh, Fender Blackface. Uh, what did he use? I forgot. Yeah. Deluxe, maybe. Deluxes. Yes, yeah. he used a couple of deluxes. Another good story about that. Like, what's the the song? Um, Long December, mm -hmm. that one. Yep. He came in totally inspired and said, I wrote this song last night. So he you know, taught it to everybody. And I think it was take two was the take. And then he did one over it up at the end and uh, towards the end, the background thing, that yeah, yeah thing. And that was it. It was super, super quick. Because the setup was already up. We just went, bam. That's amazing. And that's probably the most popular song on the record. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's, it's a masterpiece. And what was great about it for me is like, it was the second album, yes? Mm -hmm. And there's always that, I don't know about disappointment, but there's always with bands, they have a big hit because they'd had a big hit on the first record. Mr. Jones. Yeah, Mr. Jones. And so mm -hmm. the second album usually could be, from a lot of artists, a little bit of a lull because you know, what do they say? It takes your whole life to write your first album. Yeah, the sophomore record's tough. Yeah. You know? That to me is like, 
an example of a band just going, just elevating, like taking the success that they had achieved with Mr. Jones and just coming in and just like, wow. Yeah, yeah they're really great. That was a good experience. Wonderful. How long did it take? Six months, I six think. Six months? Yeah, we all went to, we went to New York to mix it with Andy Wallace, and then they didn't like Andy Wallace's mix, and then we, you know. Who ended up mixing it? Oh, I um, I forgot. Yeah. Oh, um, Barbiero, Michael Barbiero ended up mixing it. Nice. Yeah. So like me and Gil tried to mix it, but he mixes like a, a, a Brit and I mix like an American. <laughs> so he'd come in and take all my low end out and stuff and I'd go back in and dirty it up again. And cause I had a, I, I had a picture in my mind what I wanted to sound like. Right. So, but you know, we fired ourselves and right. it's like, let's, let, let's get Andy Wallace. Oh my God, that'd be amazing. Yeah. So I went to, you know, and they didn't like Andy's mixes. It's like, all right, well, I feel so bad now. What was it they didn't like about <laughs> Andy's, do you think? I, I don't know. Right. I don't know. I just wondering about the different styles. Um, yeah, Adam just wasn't into it, so they like Barbiero's mix. I think it's, the record sounds great, though. Oh, I think really, the record really happy one with of, it. Uh, I, for me, I think it's one of the pinnacles of the '90s. I really do. I think for an American record, easily the, one of wow. the best American records. That's great. Yeah, no, I've, you don't I, understand I, I don't, how much we're big. I don't fan. hear about that record anymore. No one even. It's well, when even, we were making the um, the second Frey record, we referenced that all the time. Wow, mm -hmm. nice. Yep, <laughs> we were like, that's how records should sound. Because they came from that same perspective. They were, well, they were, they were basically church kids that never even heard rock and roll. It, as simple as that. They were just playing like, you know, music, you know, like worship music. And they're like, oh, we have to. So I'd come in and play them Peter Gabriel and they'd be like, who's this? And then they knew the Counting Crows from the hits, but we came in and we would listen to that whole album and we'd just be like completely inspired. Wow. Because it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's that blend. It's the Roots Americana side with a bit of like indie rock in there at times, you know, has the credibility of a band that's a little bit indie, not so major label and slick. And then you throw in all that Beatleness, you know, with the strings and I'm not sleeping and just that. Gil Norton. Yeah? yeah. You think he was a, a huge inspiration? Huge influence on that record. Oh, right. oh yeah, my God, he's amazing. Pixies and yeah. Foo Fighters and- What was- uh, Echo it, and the Bunnymen, you know? So, oh, Echo and the Bunnymen, fantastic. So from a from from some standing back and what, watching the production side, the producer side, what do you what do you think a great producer like that brings to that record? Well, Gil, he helps just instrumentation, like where the kicks are hitting and bass lines, and I don't. Know, he can just he's he can just go inside of the song and just pull the best he can pull the best out of the artist, basically. You know, so it's like, it's like going to fun summer camp. We're gonna go make a record, it's gonna be great. We're all in it together. We all eat at the same time, we knock off at the same time, you know, we're just we're all, we're all in it together, kind of thing. It's a good, That's lesson, great. good lesson for me, you know. I, I learned a very similar thing from Jack Douglas, where it was like, he'd always call it, uh, what do you call that, like uh, herding cats, <laughs> like just making sure that everybody is all wrangled in and everybody's taking breaks at the same time, the same thing, everybody's yeah. in the same stuff, I, I think. It's like an, an organism. <laughs> you know? And also, I felt like with 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 Jack, when especially working with one of the with the bigger artists, is making sure that yeah, you might be the, and I'm I'm going to use this like only the bass player. I don't mean that in a negative sense, but your voice is just as important as the lead singers. Right. I think that's what good producers can do. You know what I mean? They 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 can make everybody in the room feel important. Or a good producer can knows when to fire the drummer and get a different drummer, <laughs> which is hap which has happened with me and me and. A my production partner, Black Dahlia, it's like, it's like, you know, they're not cutting it. So we have to get a ringer in and, you know, sometimes drummers cry. Right. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't always go team, team style, you know, it's all right. like what's best for the record and the song and the, right. and the band. It's like, don't cry. You're still in the band. Yeah. <laughs> We're just using this guy for the single. <laughs> well, Kenny Anoff talks about that, doesn't he? he? He admits that he didn't play on the first two Mellencamp records and he was given the choice of like, you know, you know this story? No, really? Yeah. Yeah, he was basically Why? given the choice. He's like, you know, stay here and learn. And he's like, I wanted to learn why they were using a different drummer on this. Hmm. Yeah, he talks about it openly. And I think, and now, of course, from that period on, he became one of the most, especially in the 80s and early 90s, he was like one of the most used session drummers in the world. For sure. He was here a couple months ago. Yeah, he was here a couple months ago playing. I mean, humility in this industry is a, is, is, is a big deal. If you've got it, you can do really, really well, I think. Humility in short supply. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. What do you, 
I mean, I, I sort of just want to get into your mind and find where you've learned lessons because you're, what you're telling us here is like, it's, it's mentorship. You're working with people and you're learning stuff from them. What, what? I, was, I was an assistant around town for many years. So I got right. to learn from people's mistakes and see all the cool things they were doing and just, you know, grab the good bits right. like that. So I thought it was very, very valuable to like observe people. What was source. interesting there, you pointed out, you learn from the mistakes first. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. See people mess up, it's like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, whether it's like a, a people thing or a mm -hmm. microphone technique or whatever. Right. You have to lay back in the cut and stay out of it. Stay out of the mistake that someone else makes, you know. Learn, from, learn from it. So after recovering satellites, where did you go after that? What was the record after that? I think that was the, the, the big one was the Foo Fighters record after that. Right. Yeah. Went up to Seattle and met, met the guys and got on. It was just so great, you know. It was me thinking like so many people are going to hear this record. Like I was just starting out as an engineer. So it's, mm -hmm. it's like, man, everyone's going to hear this record. So it's got to be it's so on, you know. Oh, I remember how huge that record was. I remember like I came out of my house and uh, there was roofers across the way. They were jamming Monkey Ranch and like, you know, on, on the roof, like, yeah, dancing to Monkey Ranch. I was like, yep. <laughs> it must have been an amazing feeling. <laughs> yeah. That, I, that was the first time I heard it, like not, you know, not in the studio. I heard of, you know, I think uh, K-Rock was probably playing it or something. So it was pretty, pretty neat. Reminds me of that Sting, <laughs> you know? Sting story saying that they said, how do you know when you're famous? And he goes, when I was staying in a hotel room and the guy cleaning the windows outside was going, walking on the moon. He like just singing it out of tune. He's like, that's when I knew. <laughs> nice. I love that stuff. So yeah. Foo Fighters, um, what about after that? How did it keep going? Gosh, I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> I mean, it's been so long. I, I forgot what happened after that. But uh, I started working all over the place, you know. Let me see. I mean, before all that stuff, I worked with Gil, and, Gil Norton on the, the Mises record in England. Mm. And uh, how, that, how I met Gil is like, he, I guess, you know, back then everyone had cassettes and he, he got some cassettes from different people. And uh, the, um, Joe Reineke, the guy, the, the leader of the band, the Mises, he, he wanted to use me, so I, I got to throw my cassette in the in the fray there. And he he liked. Uh, I worked with a couple of mod bands, and really, I just gave him little bits, little cool bits of songs, not the entire song. Yeah. So that's, that's what he liked, just little the little bit cool bits, and didn't bore sure. him for the whole thing. So he said, "You know, fancy popping up to San Francisco for a drink?" I'm like tonight. It's like okay, right. hop up for a drink tonight. <laughs> yeah. So I got a plane ticket and went and met him and worked on the record and got to work on a cool, bunch of cool records with him. That's amazing. Yeah. I realized he was quite that eclectic. That's like all over the place from like massive artists to independent artists and everything in between. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose for me, that's something I've always described a, a great producer is not genre specific. That's right. Yeah. And I worked on a, a distiller's record with him too. Punk record. Wow. Uh, up at the site. Have you been to the, up at the, the site no, I before? That's, it's like a, like a residential type situation. Go up there and live and work. That was cool. And I think Andy Wallace mixed that one as well. So I'm assuming, as we're sort of touching on, genre-wise, you love exploring all the different things because you're just talking about the record you're making at the moment where you have choir on it. and Super pop. Yeah. Super pop records. It, it could be huge. These guys are amazing. Have you heard of Holy Child yet? I, you know, I, I did literally because when we came here, I thought I better do my homework. They have a song <laughs> called Bathroom Bitch. It's hilarious. It's like a really light, lighthearted video, but she's like, I want to fuck you in the bathroom. <laughs> kind of stuff, you know. Right. So Very PC. <laughs> but they're they're a really really cool band. They got some really neat songs. I have to check they're, it they're out. Gonna, gonna, I think the record comes out in springtime, so hopefully it'll blow up. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So you're you're working on that now, and are you gonna you doing the whole thing? Are you gonna? Well, I'm. Um, I they they do these in like four or five song chunks. So I, I'm okay. just working on the last the last chunk of songs. And I so the producer Louis's gone home, and he's going to go through all the overdubs we did and and mix it. So fantastic! I'm done. You're done. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm, okay, I'm done. great. Yeah, just just recorded all the all that stuff for them. That's amazing. Yeah, they were they were stoked, super happy, with everything. So do you it's also nice. have like a home setup as well, or are you? I do. Yeah. What do you have, what do you have at home? Um, it's a Studer board and, you know, a, a big, huge tracking, uh, it's like a 1920s living room, like a, a barn shaped living room, really. And wow. it's, a, it's a great drum room, some ISO and it's, it's a, it's a cool, like garden studio. It's really nice. So you come here because of the absolutely crap ton worth of outboard, I presume, and instruments and all the instruments and stuff are super inspirational. Yeah. yeah. You know, like I, I brought a band here called, uh, AM radio hits a couple months ago and they, they had a song 
they, they, they saw the vibes and they were inspired to write a part in the vibes, you know? So it's like a, all the, all the stuff laying around here is great for inspiration. A C9 grand piano? Stevie Wonder's piano, Songs in the Key of Life piano. And I didn't know that. So that piano came with the studio. You didn't know that? Oh man. I think I may have That's missed that in the last time. We'll <laughs> so, make sure that so goes in there. Talking book and Songs in the Key of Life uh, wow. were done on that piano. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, I, I played really badly on it the other day. Now I feel really nervous. <laughs> Go back and be like, but there's timpani and like orchestra bells around, and just you know, really nice set of vibes, and you know, just not just a, a room. You're not just renting a room. It's, there's a bunch of cool stuff in there: pedals and amps and guitars and basses and tons of mics. Amazing. Yeah, Slash Box Slash Record was fun here. That was uh, that was the you know the very cap cable the. Uh, the uh, UTA Vericap cable that the inspiration for Vericap came from Slash because me and uh, me and the other assistant Trev we put, plugged in not Slash's big ridiculous monster cable we plugged in something else and it was like Wah! feedback crazy and it's like oh hmm. and we're like what why are cable why do cables sound different what is that you know and we asked super genius Larry Jasper so whom you know, hopefully you'll be able to interview he said oh that's just capacitance just you know the longer the cable the more high end roll off simply. So Eric said, can, I wonder if we can make a cable with, you know, capacitors in there to imitate the length of that. And Larry's like, oh, oh wait, that could be done. Mm -hmm. That could be done. So they got, a, they, you know, they developed and there's, Eric has a patent on it. <coughs> That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a really, That's very smart. It's cool because it's like, you know, you've got your guitar amp for tone, your guitar for tone. Now you can have the, the tone on the cable, right? And it, it, it kind of like, <coughs> if you have like a super spanky Fender amp and a, and a telly, say, you know, you start, you start spinning the spinning the uh rotary encoder and, until it you know gets gets dull what it does is <coughs> it like rolls off the high end and there's a bump at the roll off you know so you're you're, you're bumping it say two five or three it sounds plenty bright but not like annoyingly toppy and grating you know it's a really neat tool that's yeah. pretty amazing yeah i think it's interesting because i've only ever thought about it in in a negative way now it's a total positive so i remember that thing is cool as hell. Doing records and like <laughs> splitting into 15 different places and always being kind of bummed because you've got so much cable length that you know you can't quite get the brightness. But that that makes absolute sense. Yeah, and there's there's also a new little uh, buffer box we have so we can like we first had uh, made it like it has to interact with the pickups and the guitar and the guitar amp only. Right. So with this buffer box, you can plug it into a pedal board and it's just not an issue it's just you right. can, it can makes it talk to the outside world without the having to have the interaction with amp and guitar right so that's amazing yeah everyone should have one <laughs> maybe really everyone good. will yeah eric you're gonna get good one stuff well i just bought the 666 mic you, you did, did? <laughs> i literally did because i was like right al was talking about it you're bringing it up 666 how much was it <laughs> I got it for 250 and the rest of the mics were between 300 and 400. So I was like, you know what? I'm like, was it colored like this? Like one? I, like I'm, I'm like yeah, working yeah. and he bought it. It's Dope. like, what? But he <laughs> bought I mean, it before you mean the price went up. To the boss, before you the mean. price went up. <laughs> you mean you bought it to give to the boss. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've yeah. got to be at the studio. <laughs> nice. <laughs> throwing, yeah, throwing it in, throwing in the yeah, kitty. Yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's cool. See, Tim's got a good idea. I got a truck rental. Whoa. Wowza. <laughs> And then we're going to do like lateness fees, you know. It's called ten dollars a week. <laughs> you pay it off in twenty months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Marvelous. Really, you found one for two fifty. Yeah, and I got it. There you go. God bless you. Dope. Does it, does it look just like this? Yeah. Like a right, freaking submarine way. from. Oh, did amazing. you bring the very acoustic in, Tim? Oh, look at this. So I got one of these. This is Eric's, but I got one from um, oh, wow. Electrovox, but it sounds amazing on like Trump. It's like if you put on a horn section, it's like, oh, wow, there's that sound. Holy shit. <laughs> you know, it's like wow. shocking. Look this first... one up as well, Eric. And there's like, you know, voice settings. Like that's the, the widest one. And they start taking low end off as you pull this little spring here. Right. Which is also fantastic because so it can't so accidentally like be moved. End, low end roll off, you know. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah, that's, I like that. I like, that is defined. It's like, you want to move it, it takes some effort. Oh, I didn't but, accidentally knock it. So that, that's like a, a cheaper ribbon mic you can get into. Like if you want a 44 or something, it's really expensive. This is, you can still get these for a decent price. Probably. What's this one called? Very acoustic, variable acoustic. Variable acoustic. Mm -hmm. Eric is actually looking up as we speak. He's going to want to redeem his lightness by buying this too. I mean, drag is, <laughs> it's, it's got the old style, uh, the old style thread. So these, these end up staying on the stands. If I loan it out to people, it's like they 
it's useless when it comes back like this. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this thing's chunky and cool. It looks absolutely amazing. It looks like this should be in a recording studio. Again, though, it's just like, I, I love this sort of 50s feeling and looking. Well, it's probably 40s. It's like World War II style. Yeah, colors. 40s. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, it's like, it looks like, it looks like pretty indestructible. Hammer nails with it all day and record with it all night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Multi-purpose, <laughs> multifunctional. So tell us a little bit about your, um, your association with UTA then. Well, about, let me see, I guess it would have been the end of 12, 13, uh, 2013, uh, Tim, Tim O'Sullivan and the guys were making uh, the first 10 unfair childs and they needed some help wiring. So I thought, I'll come down and learn how to solder. Awesome. Nice. So, <laughs> so I didn't you know, did know how to solder and those guys taught me all, all kinds of stuff about, you know, wiring and soldering and stuff. We, we finished those 10 and you know, then that kind of rolled into the EQ prototyping and stuff, and we built the EQ, and and uh, well, then we built a hundred of those EQs, and we we learned from that you should never build a hundred or something first. You have to build a, a, a they we, they did a prototype, but they didn't do a pilot. You should do a prototype kind of jankety box, and then you do like one or two pilots to to abuse and see what's you know mm -hmm. what has to change and stuff. But we so we, if we made a mistake, it happened a hundred times. So I had to jump things a hundred times or, you know, nip out some circuit board or whatever kind wow. of thing. So it's very, very can do and DIY around here. But you know, th those products are all developed now and the contract manufacturer makes them. Amazing. So, yeah. So the, the, these EQs are super powerful. I mean, some people think they're kind of complicated, but once you understand the deal, the, these EQs go, but they can go between a bell curve and a, and a, a, um, what's the, uh, damn, uh, a shelf <laughs> a bell and a shelf right so it's it's um so you see bcn yeah boost cut notch oh wow. you, can, you can notch really get a surgical notch out of this thing that's really smart it's really cool yeah and um what else yeah you can match phase and stuff too like if you're going to notch something like say oh, i see how that's say nice. say you're going to notch out like 400 right yeah you go into notch and this is the deepest point five yeah. so you'd think it would be 10 but that does nothing zero does nothing and 10 does nothing but if you go to five it's like if you look at it on a graphic it's a super yep. super notchy notch yep notchy notch <laughs> <laughs> the notchiest notch and uh you can you know then you can widen it out with the cue like that and as, as you come past five it turn it, it it's flipping the phase see so you can actually phase correct a snare and overhead say or something like that but and that was a total like happy accident they found out wow yeah that's that's like the most not obvious thing F five is the you know, the notchiest it can be and it's, you know coming back to nothing i think uh, i one of the things i love about um you know this company is the fact it reminds me of what we loved and why people always talk about a rangers why they talk about um Cadac. lots of these companies came from engineers that yeah. could buy consoles, but they were usually built for broadcast market because it was bigger than, than you know, right. rock and roll guys. And so they ended up building their own equipment yeah, or at least hiring people to build it specifically for them. And that's what I love about this company is it comes from that same mentality. Eric, Eric is so amazing. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a feature of this console, right, left swap. Like if you're EQing a guitar that's over here mm -hmm. and your EQ is over here, you just swap sides. Yeah. It's just totally intuitive engineer stuff that people wouldn't think to put in there, you know? Yep. And like the mic pre's, you can add two, two, two styles of input transformer, output transformer, load. There's a, you know, a 20 dB pad in the front, 10 dB pad on the out. So you can just crank the, just crank the living daylights out of it and it won't, it won't, you know, destroy the DAW, you know? That's it's really, really cool, cool stuff. Very and, smart. And the whole like centered metal thing of this console, oh, yeah. it's like, you know, it doesn't, the reflections don't come back and comb filter. It just, just goes through it transparently. That's smart as well. Yeah. And he also, these are custom knobs. So when you take pictures for recall above, the skirt does this so you can see exactly what the numbers are, right? Good that, thinking. That's, that's the, yeah, the idea behind these. You can get overhead with the camera and, and uh, take, a, take a good shot for recall. So but these are really, really great EQs and people are kind of baffled by them because, because of the, you know, the, the, uh, bell to the bell shape and, and, and a shelf shape. But another cool thing, like Eric's trick for kick drum is, is, um, 
these these filters can you engage the filter and like you want to you say you want to bump it at 80 you do this and like this this is just a, a gentle roll off but as you as you come with the cue this way there's a little notch yeah so there, you know there's there's actually a bump at 80 and right. a drastic drop off right? right so that's that's like the eric trick for for his his kicks and stuff this console is amazing too you can you know the bus the bus matrix is all right here it's all just concentric pots you know rather than have using all the real estate with a bunch of winky buttons and stuff mm -hmm. it's just all the bus one through 13 uh one through 12 13 through 24. yeah and there's you know, the tube stereo bus on this console also so there's like you know stereo bus and then the uh bus masters for one through 12. whoops one through 12 and bus masters for 13 through 24. Just like send them. yeah six cents stereo one and two mono for three four five six the eq and all, all the stuff that you need is right in front of you like phase you have to reach up up here right a lot of consoles you got to reach up to eq or reach up for phase it's all all the stuff you need is like right here and there's also a plus minus 10 trim which is super super handy that is really handy you know say so like there's there's a fader gain thing in this board like um eric operates in the up position so all his, when he tracks all his faders are like this is out of headroom so then he, you know, pops this in. He can do that. I I operate with a, with fader gain down. So my, I like I like to I like to have some headroom in my faders. Just different right. style, just different style of working. No, but that makes sense. Uh, I understand both mentalities. You remember uh, um, what was it, the old BBC way that when it was up there that that meant the channel was at, was down, not the other way around. God. Yeah. And there was a whole philosophy for a while where they thought you were pulling the music towards you. What? Yeah. Oh my lord! Yeah. I'm sure <laughs> lots of comments and questions about that one because that's about all. My, that's the extent of my knowledge. I'm not an expert. The Grandmaster console had it was a broadcast console, that, so you could like solo it. You could hear you, you could hear what's going out before you send it. You know what I mean? Little button mm -hmm. on the bottom, click click. You could you could hear what's, what you're going to go before you're on air. Very so, smart. Yeah. Very smart. I didn't realize that was a broadcast console. Yeah, yeah little 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 solo buttons. I think they got it from a, a TV station in Canada, actually. Yeah, it's a really amazing console. That 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 studio had so many little things about it. I remember when you'd come in through the warehouse. Yeah, the parking had garage. That white Rolls Royce in there. That was that was uh, it was a Bentley, and that was uh, Billy Preston's Bentley. That's what I heard. It was Billy Preston's. Also, the white there. piano was Billy Preston's too. I'd heard all that, but I didn't yeah. know if it was folklore or real. So it was real. You're paying off cocaine debt. And I'd heard. <laughs> I don't no, story. That's what, that's what it was. There was always a story about Billy Preston and Ringo Starr. That's yeah. What I used to hear. Yeah. The, the, you remember the bathrooms upstairs, all the yep. weird bathrooms? They used to party up there and stuff, apparently. And there was an Italian restaurant across the way that burned down that they used to eat over there and come over, you know, and do studio stuff and get blasted or whatever they were doing. <laughs> you know? God bless the 70s. There's that parking garage. There's a good Foo Fighter story. Like we, we uh, recorded that Hero song, right? Mm -hmm. And Dave wanted to do, he song. wanted to do double drums on that. So, also, because we had a kind of a not great experience with Pro Tools up in Seattle, uh, he said, I don't want any Pro Tools on this record. It's all going to be tape. Great. So like some people think we've Pro Tools, but there's zero Pro Tools on the record, actually. It's all, you know, tight musicianship and punching and stuff. But like he wanted to do double drums, so we set the second set up in the garage right there. And I had like a the shotgun mic all the way at the end so you you could you can really hear a delay in there so when he's doing all those toms they're mm -hmm. pretty tight you can hear them go out sometimes but you can hear the slap from the parking garage like if you, I, if you listen and there's it's I'm not gonna go back it's not pro tool so man he is so tight that yeah. those kicks are just lined up and just it's amazing yeah he's so, he's we, so we forget the musicians can actually do that when yeah. when pushed yeah so like it, it wouldn't be so obvious but if now that i've told you go back and listen you'll hear you hear two drum sets going I'm going to go back and listen to all the go arounds and the toms and all that. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, some of my favorite bands would do that back in the seventies. It's uh, we just seem to have lost the idea of that that can be done. Yeah. There's the, whatever Dave wanted to do, like he, he didn't like to use headphones. So uh, you know that thing where you put NS tens, you flip yep. them on a phase and stuff. Yep. So I said, oh yeah, we can like Gills, you know, dear Dave, Gills sitting behind there. So oh, yeah, we can do this thing, and Gills behind Dave going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's too late it's too late <laughs> said it but he sings he sings pretty quietly and, and we, you know we have this, the speakers quiet where it was usable mm -hmm. and when he screams it sounds like a blood curdling loud scream but it's a really quiet thing that happens in his throat mm -hmm. so he's like just red faced but it's, he's really quiet he's, he's screaming right now i can't believe that's his, you know that's his scream in the microphone it's very quiet 
That's fantastic. Yeah, so so we were able to do most of the record like that with just speakers. That's amazing. Yeah, it just, just doesn't like that underwater feel of headphones, I guess. I think, hopefully you've got some visuals of it, but I remember that, that parking garage was pretty massive. Yeah. Just to think about in the center of Hollywood, especially now, it's like the most hip place, the Quanga. That neighborhood used to be gnarly. Yep. Oh, I remember. <laughs> yeah. I remember. It's gentrified now. Remember, you remember Swing House was just around the corner there? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's... The first Swing House. Yeah. The, the original. Mm -hmm. We had that, we had that little, we had the studio in the crow's nest overlooking the whole thing. Oh, did you, did you uh, work over there? Did you I studio? did work over oh, there. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, with ADATs. Jeez. And that little crow's nest thing and then the big black stage. And I did pre-production in there with the Chili Peppers on Californication. That was... Wow, did you produce that? No, no, Engineer no, I didn't it? produce it. Oh, no, I just did the, just pre-production. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. How yeah. fun. That was Yeah, that was fun seeing that kind of work going on there. I worked on a Fishbone record where they had like cast of thousands come for a song so that Red Hot Chili Peppers minus, uh, um, what's the singer's name? Oh, minus Anthony. Yeah, Anthony, uh, Anthony yeah. wasn't there, but everyone else wasn't there. Like Billy Bass from Earth, Wind & Fire was there, and there was right. just like just tons of musicians. At, uh, do you remember David Berewald's studio? Remember that? In, in, Venice. in Venice? Yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. Remember it's that funny, room? it was one of the first studios so that, I ever visited room. in 95 when I moved here. Yeah, so that room That was an did. amazing studio. It was like this huge, like, at least for me, it felt huge in 95. And it was, again, so it was a crow's nest at the top, wasn't it? Overlooking this. Like the drum room was up top. Yeah, drum room yeah. was up top. So, and, you know, that was such a weird session. No headphones. We just blasted the bigs. Right. You know, th I remember three bass players, Norwood, Flea, and Billy Bass. Wow. That was a great studio because they did a lot of Tuesday Night Music Club there, didn't they? Oh, it, yeah. I guess so. I missed all that, but yeah. Yeah, because it was, yeah, it was like I got here at 90, October 95, and I think I visited it right at the end of the year. And I went there and I was just kind of overwhelmed. I'd never. Been, any, been anywhere like that. I, I think we, I did that Fishbone record in 2000. So, and he, he moved shortly after that. So it was gone by 2001. Oh, wow. That was a whole, I remember just landing in Los Angeles and sort of like being in places like that and just being like, and you wow. open the door and there's the beach. Yeah. <laughs> it was really cool. And it, he was like, he was like, oh yeah, next door is Andy Summers. And I just remember my mind was blown. And I'm like, wow. I'm in oh, the really? studio and Andy Summers is next door. <laughs> So, yeah, just that, that whole like, thing, you know, when you're when you're younger and you're just overwhelmed by all yeah. of these possibilities. Yeah, these yeah these rooms are magic out here. Amazing. Well, thanks ever so much. It's a pleasure. Been so cool. Please leave a whole bunch of comments and questions below. Maybe I'll try and throw Any, you anything on I can answer. There you go. Yeah. Did you hear that? You said anything can answer. Lots of people have Foo Fighter questions and stuff about you know. There's a lot of gear sluts threads about what happened on the Foo Fighters and stuff. And Do you hear that? You said he asked some Foo Fighter questions. Sure, or whatever, anything. Oh, ouch. So <laughs> I'll give these away bunch all my secrets. I don't, I don't keep any secrets. <laughs> well, I think that the reality is, just to top and tail that, is like you can tell me exactly how you do something, but we all hear in different ways. So we can learn from each other and just apply it to our way of working. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about this. We can share information and all grow together but we all interpret it in a completely different way. Yeah, always something to learn. Always something to learn. Yeah. Thanks ever so much. All right. Appreciate Wonderful. it.